Welcome to Crime by the Bar. Welcome to Crime by the Bar. Here we are again. It's Tuesday. I'm Jonathan. Sorry. I'm yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it is Tuesday. I'm Anna. And we're here. We're back again, and it's finally cooling down. It's not the ridiculous inferno in here that it normally is. It, it, the ice pack might be helping that, but I'm just feeling cozy, good, and ready for some. Oh, I'm not going to say horrible. I think we'll have some good tales today. Yeah, I think this is going to be a nice ease in after our mm. our little mini pre-summer break. I think so. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we needed that. Well, I needed that. The break. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it uh, it has been helpful. Um, well, I say that as if I've done anything productive. Well, actually, I kind of have. You dealt with the fridge? You're living with someone new? We have a new person on the boat. This is true. No, but I've been slightly productive. But regardless, we are we're here and this is the most important of projects. Yeah, I think so. Mm. This week we are talking about movies. In general, yes. Yeah. That inspired crimes or that mm. were inspired by crimes. Mm. Um first of all, I wanna ask you, I have to ask you, <laughs> what is your favorite uh true crime movie? And why? Oh goodness, I was not prepared. I have not done my homework that's okay just off the top of your head <laughs> i i can answer the question and give you time to think oh please do please my do. question mm-hmm, yeah mm-hmm. Uh, um I, I am interested so okay i think i think my absolute favorite is chicago hmm. because i love the sing songs and <laughs> it's just good it's just all around good and mm. it's based on two real murderesses yeah, yeah, yeah. and but I also, what else? Mind blank. Oh dear, I'm in your boat now. Changeling, <laughs> the Angelina Jolie one. Yeah. That was a really good one and really creepy and really sad. It was very effectively creepy, yes. That was a very good one. I won't steal it, but I can't really think of that much else. Like I do love my movies, but I do tend to kind of gloss over the whole oh this story is based on true events what about what why 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 mostly because it's been so vague oh. in certain things and sometimes it's just like no no we took a name or a place and a general event and then ran with it yeah um like there are some i know there are some good like we're talking proper uh renditions of you know okay yes this is an entertainment movie, but we're taking all the facts and we're weaving this narrative along the lines of what happened. Like Zodiac? Like Zodiac, yeah. But um, I can't think of any favourites off the top of my head. To be Goodfellas? I honestly did not remember that Goodfellas was uh, based on a true story. And it's more or less uh, oh, okay. accurate to the real life story. That I did not know. I really love Goodfellas. <laughs> and that is my problem because there are probably a lot of movies that I really love that I just don't really think of them as that connection because I focus a bit more on the fancy movie bits. Mm. Mm. Have you seen The Exorcism of Emily Rose? I have not. I've had it recommended, but I haven't seen it yet. I am terrible with horror movies. So this mm-hmm. is one that I looked up IMDb and read all the spoilery things and then oh. watched it. But um, <laughs> more than anything else, it's just really sad. And awful, and it's hmm. kind of why am I re- well, whatever it's done. Burn after reading is one of those movies that it's um like oh based on true story, real life events, blah blah blah, and it's totally not. Yeah, um, but <laughs> I was gonna say I I remember enjoying that one immensely I love though that movie yeah. and the bit where Brad Pitt's in the closet and George Clooney opens it. And, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, but yeah, apparently pretty much all the characters were inspired by people the Coen Brothers knew. Mm. Big Lebowski was also um, the dude was totally based on someone they knew. Oh, that I can see. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Oh, I wasn't thinking of that, but there was one relatively recent movie. I think it was Tom Cruise playing a um, an American pilot who 
kind of got recruited by the CIA and then kind of got recruited by... Um, it's not like Valkyrie or something? Which I've never seen. No, no, no. That that's just uh, so. Pure this is, Nazism. Yeah, that's I, which I yeah. a bit further back. This isn't that far back. So I this haven't is, seen uh, any of these. I know. I think the movie goes through seventies and eighties. I guess uh, he, he ends up uh, part going back and forth between like working for the CIA and working for um, drug runners huh. and smuggling drugs into America and then flipping back and forth between the sides, which was apparently very much well based on someone. I was quite surprised at how much I enjoy that movie, though. Yeah? I did not expect my father picked it for a wow. movie night. So That's kind of nice for a change. Hmm. What I else so. is good? Um, Gilda. No, that's not based on a true story. Never mind. Um, don't know. No. Yeah. But we're in a movie mindset. We are in a movie mm. mindset. So, for... I'm not sure if I should ask which side of the inspiration it is, but maybe we can leave that be. But first off, we need to know who's worst. I think I'm, I think I'm pretty tame this week. Oh, so do I. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, how do we judge this? Mm. Um, I have no gore. Mm -hmm. No one's really missing out. There's no shitty. Too much. Well, no. no deaths or anything. Nope. No, no deaths. Hmm. I don't think there's any creep factor either. Hmm. It's kind of the same for me, actually. Oh, dear. Do you want to rock, um, paper, scissors that? Or can I just go first because you always go first? I, I was going to say you go first because I'm pretty sure I'll go first uh, later in the week. But um, I do love a nice uh, rock, paper, scissor. Oh, Okay. But, but then, I, no, I no, you know what, okay. you know what, screw it. You have a drink in your hand. I shan't and ruin I can't that lovely left, relationship. Right. So... Let's say you go first. Okay. I am pretty sure I'm going to ask you the question. You're going to, yes, I do know who you're talking about. Oh. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. Have you heard of Frank Abagnale Jr.? I think so, but I can't place it for the life of me. Do Have, tell, do tell. There will be okay, a you know what, huge I'm, soundbite of me trying to contain my... <gasps> I'm, the mic later, probably. I'm, but. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm just going to launch into it and... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think you're going to work it out. So, right. Frank Abagnale was born on King's Day. Well, well, he was born on the 27th of April, 1948. So, um, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't King's Day at the time. Um, but, yeah, so he's like 70 now. And he was born in the Bronx in New York. He grew up with two brothers and a sister. Um, and they lived about 17 and a half uh, miles or 28 kilometers from Manhattan. Mm -hmm. His father was um, in the military and during the war had met Frank's mother while stationed in Montpellier in France. Oh. Um, his parents separated whenever Frank was 12 and they were divorced by the time he was 14. Um, I apparently just stopped typing mid-sentence here, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I mean that Frank's dad ran a stationary uh, business um, for most of his childhood. Okay. Um, things start to get interesting when uh, in 1963, at age 15, Frank got his first job. So he was working part-time and he had a junior driving license, which I looked up and it seems... I, I don't think this is going to be the one. But, no, it was... Okay, continue. I, I think I know, but yes. Okay. Um, a junior driving license, as far as I can tell, means that you can do daytime driving, like 9 a.m. or sorry, 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. And you can't have anyone under 21 in the car unless they're members of your immediate family. And the only reason you can uh, drive in the evening, like, well, from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., is if... Because of your schooling or your employment um, and you have to carry proof of either um, okay. that you have to. Um, so he has this magical, magical situation where a 15 year old is driving around trying to make some money um, really having a, a tough time after his parents divorced and his mom is uh, seems to be taking less and less of an interest in him and the kids. Mm. So his dad is trying to do everything to, to make things a little bit easier and um, even gives him a truck um, to go to and from work and his old mobile credit card, um, which was oh. to cover gas money. 
Mm. Um, so Frank had already looked kind of old for his age and he was dating people. You're making what? Is it? Yes. Come on. It, uh, okay, I'll, I'll just, um, it's DiCaprio, right? I'm not telling you. Okay, fair enough. You, I just you, won't, won't have my guess there. Just continue. That no, you, you need to guess at an appropriate moment. That wasn't an appropriate moment. <laughs> no, no, that was just for my, <gasps> but okay. Okay. Um... <laughs> So, um, yeah, Frank looked old for his age and was already going on dates, but he didn't really have the money to fund them. So he decided, I know what I'm going to do. And this is a quote from his book, um, although the book was ghostwritten. He um, propositioned an attendant at a local gas station and said, I'll buy a set of those new tires and charge them on this card. Only I don't take the tires. You give me a hundred bucks instead. You've still got the tires. And when my dad pays mobile for them, you get your cut. Your head to start with. And when you do sell the tires then the whole $160 goes in your pocket. What do you say? You'll make out like a dragon man. <laughs> um, it was a wonderful expression to be fair so that was a direct quote from his, his book um, <laughs> so over the next three months he ends up running up a bill of almost three and a half thousand dollars um, and this is 1963 so it's the equivalent of around twenty two thousand dollars today hmm. um, or like 19,000 euros um, yep. He spent it in 14 sets of tires, 22 batteries, plus gas and oil and everything else that he actually needed to run the car. Um, yeah. But I mean, I was on board with the uh, the little deal with the gas station attendant yeah. and doing that and spreading it up. But like, h- how many tires can you actually explain away to the father? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what you say when the bill comes in. I guess you don't really think that far ahead. Um, he His way of dealing with the 14 sets of tires was to, to hide the credit card bills. Oh, yes, that will help. Um, but whenever a couple of months had gone by and the charges were higher and higher and higher, mm-hmm. um, an investigator for the credit card company ended up visiting his dad, Frank Sr., mm-hmm. um, to, to try to find out what, the story was and why he wasn't paying the bill. So um, the mobile oil guy shows up, asks Frank Sr. Um, if he was planning and trading his old car in for a new one. Um, and it seemed like a really weird question to ask. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the end, Frank Sr. said, I don't even use my mobile card. My son does. Um, after the whole, there's a lot of charges on it, sir. Bit. He's like, no, 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 there, there must be some kind of mistake. So the mobile investigator starts whapping out the receipts mm-hmm. and like, he, he just... So, so you said mobile investigators. So this was actually someone from the, the credit company. credit card company. And not, oh, okay, okay. Um, and he, he starts getting the receipts out. And at this point, the dad realizes that's my son's signature. Mm-hmm. Oh, shit. So the, the short version of what happens is... Um, he ends up just paying the bill and oh. it's a lot of money but oh, yeah. um, no explanation how he manages to afford that and his stationary business does seem to go under um, not too many years later oh. yeah but yeah he pays the bill and Frank doesn't learn his lesson in fact his mum was really not happy about the whole thing and because um, she was aware that this happened afterwards but oh. she was really pushing that they don't pay the bill and that you know he's taught a lesson that's understandable though. kind of considering <laughs> like a 15 year old running up 22 grand and no consequences that's yeah gone a set of precedent But um, this was kind of the start of it all. He ended up then branching out a little bit and trying just different confidence tricks. It started out by him writing checks and, um, you know, floating them between different accounts. So he opened multiple bank accounts with multiple banks and you Mm. could end up having a check um, credited in your account before it had actually cleared. Oh, so yeah. then he would end up with more money in his account as he's waiting for them to eventually bounce. <laughs> um, and it got to the point where he would start uh, creating these fake identities to <laughs> open more fake accounts and to, to just keep going different accounts, different identities on and on and on and on. Hmm. So this is for a couple of years. So he's 15, 16, 17 at this p- stage. But 
he's enjoying it and he's experimenting with it. Yeah, I can I can tell. So he starts getting curious about other ways he can do it. And he also starts trying to make copies of checks, everything from payroll checks to um, to regular personal checks. Hmm. He starts out mimicking his own, but then he realizes that the blank deposit slips at the bank could be a really good one to <laughs> forge. So he starts creating fake ones of that and mm-hmm. replaces the magnetic ink, the, the account numbers and magnetic ink at the bottom of the deposit slips um, with his account number and then slips right. them into the, the bank's uh, little reservoir. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, people yeah. are going in to deposit money <laughs> and they end up just depositing it in his bank account instead of depositing it, depositing it in the bank's account. Mm. And he gets away with it for, for quite a long time. <laughs> he... Even later on admitted that um, whenever he was at one of the banks, he was looking around and noticed there was a lot of um, people from rental businesses. And um, so like airlines and car rentals and everything. Um, so you know, Delta and United Airlines and Hertz, they would drop off daily collections of money in a big zip bag. Um, and then they would just be left at a drop box on the airport premises. Um, So this is where he starts to get into airports. Uh At one point, he decided to rent a security guard costume um, from a local costume shop. (laughs) And he goes to an airport, puts a sign over the deposit box Mm -hmm. and that says, out of service, place deposits with security guard on duty and just starts (laughs) collecting money and checks from people who are coming by. Um, He was later on uh, quoted as saying he couldn't believe the idea actually worked. How can a Dropbox be out of service? Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's what he did. So he's he's still 16, 17, and he decides he wants to see some more of the world. So naturally, um, <laughs> <laughs> you do know who this is. I, I'm pretty sure I do know, yes. Come on, do it. Tell me. Well, you, you've already said the name, so we know who that is. But the um, the whole "Catch Me If You Can" uh, yes. movie thing, yes, yes, I love this movie. <laughs> I absolutely love this movie. Apart from the whole Christopher Walken mice and cream and butter thing. Oh right, it just irritates me so much. But yeah, so he decides he wants to see the world. Age sixteen, he creates a fake ID um, for Pan Am. Uh, Pan America World Airways Mm -hmm. and um, just like in the movie he ends up getting a Pan Am uniform by telling the company he was a pilot lost his uniform while it was being cleaned at a hotel and then got a new one with the fake ID Um, he also forged um, an FAA that's Federal Aviation Administration um, pilot's license Mm -hmm. he is estimated to have flown more than a million miles, which is uh, 1.6 million kilometers. Um, He went to 26 different countries by deadheading. Deadheading is when uh, basically any transport company um, takes you to the location you need to be to do your job. Mm. So um, if if you worked for a train company and you needed to to be in Brussels, then you get free transport to get you to Brussels or whatever. So that's that's what he was doing. He was deadheading on all of these flights. But as you can imagine, pilots get tired and um, sometimes they'll ask their deadhead to step in. So he did fly the plane several times, Mm. aged 16, 17, 18. And he said it was terrifying. I can imagine. He said he... Zero training. Yeah. He said, I was very much aware I'd been handed custody of 140 lives, my own included, because I couldn't fly a kite. (laughs) But, yeah, um... Whenever he was he was flying around, you'd think it's like just free flights, but no, he actually stayed in hotels all over the world and built mm. everything on the company. Of course. Oh, what do you mean, of course? <laughs> but well, I mean, if you've gone that far to the point where you, you know, accidentally pilot a plane that way, they're like, yeah, build everything. I you know what was crazy? I was, um, I can't say who... But I was talking to someone about this um, a while ago and and they were like, yeah, the same thing happened in the UK in the 1960s. And I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah, there was a 16 year old um, who went to Eton who was doing the exact same thing. Really? Yeah. um, Apparently for British Airways going around and 
deadheading and and <laughs> flying all over the world pr- pretty much the exact same story um except he was never uh prosecuted because okay. it was such an embarrassment to British Airways <laughs> and I think there were other airlines involved um allegedly allegedly it, it was British Airways um and allegedly it was such an embarrassment that um they they basically just banned him and his family and uh said you're not hmm. we're, we're not taking this further because they'd have to admit that they'd let this kid on I mean the the family is a bit harsh, but even not counting that, like provided that this kid didn't actually need to step in to fly the plane, yeah. Then, I mean, they got con, but it's not that big. Like I would understand it if he had. It's not good, but like like I said, I would definitely understand it if they would like want to deny and sweep everything under the rug. If um, if the kid kind of accidentally ended up piloting a plane. That's understandable. The whole giving him a free ride. I don't know. Maybe there's more to it. Ooh. I, I don't know. But <laughs> I just, I find it oh. utterly shocking that... Such a tease, come on. No, I, I actually, I don't know. I don't remember the story. I think it was after a few drinks, but I will have to ask the person. Oh, okay. I'd totally forgotten about it. Um, Update in the future. Yeah, if I'm allowed. Um, but, yeah... You so don't have an happen. NDA over you, that's fine. Yeah. Well, maybe they'll hear this and go, I'm not telling anymore, that's right. No. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think they'll care. But, um, yeah, he... Yeah, um, the only weird thing is he didn't actually fly on any... Um, yeah, he, he actually didn't fly on any uh, Pan American flights. He only flew on sister oh, flights so it's that's clever yeah. yeah he said um he was where is it yeah he he was concerned he could be potentially identified by um pan am pilots that possessed a real copy of identification and mm. understood the background of the training so he stuck yeah. to um all the other stuff you'd still think that um there's such crossover between uh i mean well maybe not i, w- I was going to say i'm sure a lot of pilots have flown for a lot of different companies, but back then probably not. It was very much like one company career type thing, right? I think so. Yeah, so I'm maybe not sure. maybe not. Hmm. But hmm. it I mean, on the one hand that's kinda of smart, and the other hand it's like, what? I mean, good for him. He didn't get caught, I guess. Um <laughs> so also the summer before he turned eighteen he decided he wanted to try his hand at something different. So he became a teacher at a university <laughs> for a whole summer semester. Um, he he said under the name of Frank Adams, he taught at um, Brigham Young University. Um, the university completely denies the claim. Um, I, I'm sure they do. Um, but yeah, he, he worked as a sociology uh, teaching assistant, um, conducted his own classes. He only read one chapter ahead in the book every time. So like, <laughs> I, I don't know how no one decided to read far enough ahead and then just catch him out. But, or maybe he really because did. Because they're students. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I just realized this is the bit in the movie when he changes schools and um, pretends to be a teacher. Mm-hmm. So that's where they got the inspiration from. Mm. No, but like, come on, there's there's always that kid in class who reads ahead. I mean, sometimes that kid was me, but... Um, <laughs> Well, I've I've done it as well, but at the same time, it's not the weirdest thing that someone holding a lecture can't answer all the questions. And if they're in one world they're salt, <laughs> they will just say, "Good question. I don't have the answer. Let me look that up until Tuesday." Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's not a weird thing. I think um, whenever you're a kid, you also sort of forget about um, this is their job. Their job is to teach this and only this. So it's like they're allowed not to know, even if it's a really basic question, like what's chapter 16 about? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's always more the approach on um, how you approach being confronted with a lack of knowledge, basically. Oh. And also there are so many snarky outs for teachers if someone would ask that. So. Oh, dear. Um, so by 19, 
Frank's pilot days come to a head, a dead head, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was so nice bad. one. <laughs> when he's in New Orleans one day and he has a bit of a wobbly moment um, and there, oh, there's some moment. suspicion that he isn't who he says he is. Uh-huh. Um, so... About to get rumbled. Yeah, he goes on one last flight and decides to retire age 18 um, <laughs> in Georgia. Um, he he finds a, an apartment, a condo, and whenever he's filling out the rental application, he decides to list his um, occupation as doctor, as uh, you do. Because yeah. if, if you're not a doctor, um, sorry, if you're not a pilot and you're not a lawyer, then you may as well be a doctor because... Why not? Yeah, it's what occurs to you whenever you're 18 and don't know what the hell to do. Mm. Um, and and he ends up getting the apartment. He moves in and makes friends with someone who is actually a doctor. And uh, it turns out there's a position going in this local hospital. <laughs> so sure enough, he gets the position and... Yeah, he much like the movie, ends up acting as a supervisor for the resident interns, um, which, I mean, they do need a shitload of training to to be interns in a hospital, but still. Um, He said mostly, like, he didn't have to do anything. All you have to do is is be there and make sure people are are around. Um, But there were a few fairly gnarly moments. Um, He didn't understand what uh, a nurse meant whenever it came to uh, a blue baby, which is essentially when there's oxygen deprivation. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he he had a little bit of a freak out. The interns were always asked to handle the big emergencies. Mostly it was just um, like broken bones, cuts and bruises, like basic things. Um, but whenever he, he had a kind of similar moment to the whenever... Eh. <sighs> He, in the end, said the stress was too much whenever he realized how many lives he was taking in his hands every night. It's understandable. Kind of. Mm. Um, Slightly, like, maybe not as many hands as, uh, not as many lives in his hands. I'm sure he only had two. Um, Then compared to the uh, airplane thing, but at the same time, it's slightly more personal and possibly horrific in a hospital environment. It it is I mean, I don't know what's worse, hospital or plane. Like, both are pretty terrifying. Mm. I mean, it's 140 at once, but it's 140 every couple of days otherwise. Yeah, but I, I still think that it's the more plane if you're is... killing them one by one. Well, that's always the thing as well. <laughs> we discussed the, uh, like, the intimacy and murder and stuff like that. But yeah. just looking at this case where him basically getting into situations where he might be solely responsible for, yeah, 140 people, 140 families, even more just completely destroyed, as opposed to here where he has hopefully knowledgeable interns that are doing the actual work. And if everything really craps out, he can just... I don't know, fake a seizure or run out in the hall and call for imagine. another call for another doctor and then try to run off. There is a way out, as opposed to if he's actually called into the cockpit and something happens to the co-pilot or so. Oh, can you imagine if like the pilot and co-pilot are, are poisoned and you're the, the hope that they yep. have? Yep, pretty much. That's kind of terrifying. So I, I think that is slightly worse. but I don't know, is it? Yeah. I, uh, I mean, provided that he would not be as co- so committed to his cover that he would not call for help if it, will, if it was really necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll give you that. Hmm. But I, I don't know. I, I guess I have it in my head that um, for all we know, people did die on his watch at the hospital and it was his fault and he got to keep on going. Whereas if he crashed the plane, then that's it. He's taken out. Really? Well, I mean, there's no reports of it, but would you admit yeah. to it? It's opening the hospital up to a massive suit, right? Of course. there. Because there would have been people uh, who died. No, that's a uh, face the, and a half. Yeah, yeah, that's the, like, oh, we want to avoid a suit 
face um, or at that general situation because I mean, fine, if he managed to bluff his way into a position and once he has his foot in the door, people might accept that. But once shit goes wrong, especially in a hospital, you want there to be an inquiry. You want there to be yep. chicks on stuff. But. Mm. Yeah. Uh, oh. Well. Yes. Sorry. The next Do bit. continue. <laughs> um, so he's had enough of being a doctor. So, what does he do? We're going for the the triple. We're going for the trifecta. Baker. Um, Baker? Firefighter. Patisserie chef. Um, Lawyer? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, back whenever he was still into forging checks and forging <laughs> IDs and forging everything else, he had decided to, uh, decided to forge a Harvard University law transcript. Um <laughs> So he ended up going to work at um, the state's attorney's office. By this point, he'd, he'd worked as a doctor for almost a year. And uh, yeah, he worked at the state's uh, attorney's office in Louisiana. Um, now, one of the cool things about Louisiana is um, you can take the bar exam multiple times. And unlike the movie, oh. he took it four times um, and he did eventually pass. Um, oh, so it was actually legitimate. No. Yeah, he. Well, that's the thing. Yes, he did legitimately pass. However, yeah. it's a multiple choice test, and he passed on the fourth time. So it could have been. And as far as I can tell, whether it's like that now, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, because a lot of a lot of states seem to say you can only take it once or twice, or there's a set number of times you can mm-hmm. take it within mm-hmm. a period, but. Louisiana, you you can take it as many times as you want, as far as I can tell. And also, the questions don't change. And the order of the questions of doesn't not. change. Oh, so all you have not. to do is remember which ones that you got wrong. Mm-hmm. So fourth time lucky. Um, so he had the forged Harvard University law transcript. He had the actual documentation to say he'd passed the bar. Um, then it's legal, then. He's a fucking lawyer, right? Well... What was kind of interesting is whenever he managed to get his job at the state's attor- state attorney general's office, um, he he didn't have to do that much lawyering. He just ran around um, doing errands and yeah, just, just mm. basic admin. Um, but there was a co-worker who actually had been to Harvard Law and kept asking him questions about it. Mm-hmm. Um, bear in mind, Frank was 19. And even though he did, like, <laughs> I, I should have printed photos, but he did look a lot older. It, it just, the, the colleague was super suspicious mm-hmm. um, and started digging into Frank's background. So he decided it was time to move again. Um, at this point, he was uh, under the name of, oh, mm. you don't want me to tell his name, honey puss. You're protecting his anonymity. Sweetie, it's too late. Um, <laughs> at this point, he was under the name of Robert Black, so he wasn't even going by mm. Frank at this point. Um, and yeah, he did eight months at the state attorney general's office and eventually did resign because of the co-worker looking into his history. Hmm. Um, so at this point, he decided to go back to his old confidence tricks. Um, but the colleague looking into him had done enough damage and Pan Am had also worked out what was going on. Oh. And it turned out he had stolen about two and a half million dollars at this point. And this Makes is in, sense. He was a busy guy. Yeah, he was. Um, and this was the 60s, so it's mm-hmm. a shitload of money. So he kind of <laughs> bounces around um, when he's 20, 21, all over the place and ends up settling in Morchard in France, which is in the movie where he is later captured. It's also mm-hmm. where his mom is from in the, the movie, but it's not where she's actually from. Oh, okay, okay. So he had a quite a bad habit of dating um, a lot of flight attendants and it was actually how he got into lawyering in the first place because years ago with his fake identity of Robert Black and yeah. um, he had dated this flight attendant who was friends with a lawyer and that's when he lied about the whole Harvard oh. thing and got the whole uh, um, insight on how to be a fake lawyer and blah 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 
So he basically set that up while he was pretending to be a pilot. So. He was just trying to boast to some girl he was dating okay. while he was a fake pilot. <laughs> so it doesn't seem like he thought it all through. And he really did seem to date a lot. And the guy, mm. I guess he, he had really good chat because he just looked like a, a regular dude, like regular mm. to dad-like dude. A regular to dad-like. <laughs> okay, I need to show you a photo of him then. Um... Have you not heard the of the resurgence of the dad? I but like sixties dad. Oh, uh, fair point. Like he just had really <laughs> dark, weird hair. I don't know. Well, he was considering his exploits. He was certainly not lacking confidence. Dude, this is what he looked like. Yeah, that's a sixties dad. It's it's not that he's unattractive. It's just <laughs> that. You'd have to have a damn good personality. <laughs> like, who looks at that and goes, I, I, I can see why people would mistake him of being older than he is. Though, yeah, I mean, he, he's he's like just, younger than 21 here. That's ridiculous. Isn't it? Yeah. He looks like a full-blown dad. Yeah. Like, he, he looks like socks and sandals wearing t-shirt tan friend with a comb over. Like, he looks like he's masking a bald, bald spot. And I don't think he is. How old do you think DiCaprio was when they made the movie? 24? 26? I would almost guess more. Uh, which is weird comparing his face with that face. Yeah. And um, we will put up uh, images on our website and probably on Twitter. Sorry about that. but <laughs> with, um, with the movie, uh, so it was a Spielberg movie. Spielberg was really against DiCaprio me meeting the real life guy because he didn't want it to ruin the whole character oh. that he built up in his head. But they did end up meeting. And actually, the real life Frank Abagnale was in the movie. I did not know this. Yes, I, I will get to the bit in the real life story. And uh, I'm going to be so disappointed if they actually reached out and asked him to be in the movie as opposed to him bluffing his way on set and just sneaking in as an extra. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was inevitable, but that would have been like the perfect round off on the story. Oh, <laughs> like pretending to be a production assistant or something and sliding in on set and then just walking in with the extras and waving at the camera and then leaving. Can you imagine? That oh, would be that would be so good. Um, I, I'm sure there was more to the story about him being in the movie. I think it was that he was against being in the movie or something. There, there was a whole big story. I can't remember anymore. Hmm. Um, but, okay, here we go. <sighs> um, so, Ma Richard, friends, 1969. Mm -hmm. We are back at it. Um, at this point, there are wanted posters around. Um, oh. Yeah, it, it wasn't as bad as the movie where it's FBI is most wanted because that's only for violent criminals and he wasn't a violent mm, criminal. Yeah. But, um, yeah, there were wanted, international wanted posters all over the show. And... Uh, and then an Air France attendant who dated him mm. goes, hey, I saw him in Mont Richard. Um, and uh, yeah, told the police. Um, so French police arrested him. That's the bit in the movie where the real life Frank Abagnale shows up. Oh. He's one of the fake French police. Oh, yeah. that's um, kind of cool. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> yeah, they arrested him. Um, he was being sought in 12 countries. Um, bear in mind, he had traveled to, oh, I have too 26 many 26 or so? 26, you're right. Yeah. He'd, he'd been in 26, so, I mean, that's a pretty decent track record. 12 of 26. Mm. Um, he, but at the same time, having both the goal and the opportunity and the time to go and do enough crimes in all these countries he's just like jetting between yeah it's but kind of impressive. i mean he's only 21 yeah um and and he was really into the science behind like what kind of press to use and what kind of ink to use and that sort of thing mm -hmm. um and he like he, he's since said that it it was really an art form back then whereas now it's all you need is a computer and you can pretty much forge anything mm. um which i mean is a bit of an oversimplification but kind it's still of, kind yeah. of yeah interesting um but yeah he had a, a two-day trial and he was given a just a one-year sentence uh by the french judge and at 
and it was later reduced to just six months. The conditions were really bad, though. Um, it was really small cell, no windows, um, and actually, for the most part, no light. Um, there was no toilet, no mattress. Um, there was uh, a, a sort of, it, it wasn't even a blanket, it, like something to wrap himself in, but not actually a, a proper blanket. Um, Getting some Monte Cristo vibes here. It, yeah, like, I mean, without the torture, <laughs> but yeah. Well, yeah. Um, and really limited food and water. And bear in mind, he's he is 21, so okay, he's, he's mm. old enough to make stupid decisions, but it's still pretty grim. But mm -hmm. don't worry, Socialist Sweden saves the day. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Um, As you hear every week so, in the press, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, probably. <laughs> um, so after six months of uh, these shitty, shitty French conditions, um, he ends up in socialist Sweden. He was extradited. Um, and under Swedish law, you guys have to be nice. Um, so <laughs> he, he was put on trial for forgery. Um, his... Defense attorney actually did a really good job and um, tried to argue that he just created fake checks instead of mimicking checks, which so he hadn't forged anything. That can be an important distinction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, OK, great. Glad we've got the Swedes <laughs> on board. Um, in the end, they they didn't uh, find him guilty of forgery. They, they reduced the whole thing to swindling and fraud hmm. um, and yeah, he, he was due to serve six months there. Um, at the end of that period, he was supposed to go to Italy to be tried there. And it was going to be like a, a pass the forger on Europe sort of thing. <laughs> um, however, a judge from Socialist Sweden. <laughs> sorry, I need to stop this. Um, no, please never stop. This is amazing. <laughs> a judge from Socialist Sweden um, made a suggestion to the U.S., uh, uh, a U.S. State Department official that um, the thing to do might be to revoke his passport because legally they weren't able to ha um, hold anyone in Sweden if they didn't have a valid passport. Mm. So that's what happened. His passport was revoked and um, then the Swedes were not able to send him to Italy. They had to return him to his country of origin, much <laughs> like a parcel. And... <laughs> Yeah, uh, so he was deported. Um, at that point, he was tried in the US. Hmm. And with everything he'd done, he ended up getting 12 years, which, I mean, it's bad, but it's not like, I mean, fine, two and a half million in the 60s and all the havoc yeah. he'd reaped. But, but also at that stage of your life, like missing your entire 20s almost. I mean, it's kind of sad. Kind of grim. Yeah, but I mean, dude. Uh, yeah, I mean, he put himself in that situation. There's no question about it. But but also, uh, it's I mean, it's been good crack, hasn't it? Um, <laughs> probably. Um, they, he had no such luck with the Swedish defense of ah, he just created some stuff. He didn't forge anything. <laughs> um, but with the statute of limitations in most countries um, for forgery and fraud, he he pretty much escaped any further legal ramifications internationally. Hmm. Um, so. After being given 12 years in federal prison, um, it was all under forgery kinds, he um, he began serving his time. But he had several more adventures along the way. Um, hmm. You might remember in the movie, he ends up escaping through a toilet on the plane. Oh, right. No, yeah. that is bullshit. That is not possible. Um, I would hope. It would be super messy if you tried it. But <laughs> he apparently did escape a plane whenever he was under arrest um, on his way back into the country. Oh. Um, the whole thing is quite sketchy and there's some debate about whether um, his version of events was true, but we know the toilet thing isn't actually possible. <laughs> um, his story involved him pushing uh, through where they would have all the catering stuff mm -hmm. and then climbing down into the hold and then oh, yeah. out through the air gear. So, yeah, probably through some sort of uh, food containment section hmm. and he ended up uh waiting until nightfall scaling a fence to get out of the airport hailing a cab going to grand central in new york um got the cab driver to take him to a safe place in the bronx he uh -huh. changed his clothes picked up some keys um which were good for a bank safety deposit box the whole way in montreal um where he'd left 20 grand in oh, uh wow. in 
and just emergency money. Yeah, I do like a good emergency stash. That's yeah. Cool. <laughs> so he ended up, um, he headed north, um, made it the whole way uh, to Montreal, got the money, then headed to Dorval Airport, um, where he bought a ticket to Sao Paulo in Brazil. However, he bumped into some Mounties at the ticket counter and the Mounties are pretty damn good because, as we know, <laughs> the Mountie always gets their men um, and they handed him over to US Border Patrol. So that was kind of the end of that great escape. It is now April 1971. Frank is ready to have some more fun. Um, he's currently being housed at a detention centre in Georgia all over again. Mm. And... Yeah, uh, he, well, okay, context. At the time, there was um, a lot in the press about c conditions in prisons. Oh, okay. Essentially, he has a friend who's working on his memoir with him. Uh, oh. Slip him the card of uh, who was the, the guy who's known as Carl Handratty. In the, in the books, but in real life is called, what is his name? Joseph Shea. Um, okay. She slips him the FBI card, um, <laughs> like business card for Joseph Shea. He carries it around in prison with him. Hmm. Um, and people become convinced that he is an undercover um, FBI officer in the prison to see what the prison conditions are like. <laughs> and of course he denies it but he also kind of perpetuates the rumor so he ends up being given way nice conditions way better food and, and is pretty well taken care of um, and meanwhile he has his uh, his friend come in and and chat away to him and like she's also taking notes because they're working on the book together <laughs> so they think it's notes on that perfect at a certain point uh yeah, in April, it all comes to a head when he decides that, yeah, it's time to leave. So he <laughs> confirms to the guards, yes, he is He is from the FBI. He has been checking them out. But basically, don't worry. It's fine. You've passed. I'm You're ready to leave great now. Job. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to leave now. Um, and here is uh, the business card of Joseph Shea. Give him a call. He'll explain the whole thing. Um, but, but you can release me now. And... <laughs> Because he's a good forger and because his friend is obviously in on it. <laughs> um, they've changed the number on the card. Oh. So it matches a, I think it's a payphone, but uh, yeah, it's a payphone in a shopping mall. And um, the friend picks up pretending to be just a, a telephone operator for the FBI mm -hmm. and, and confirms the whole story and... Uh, yeah, they, they make arrangements for her to come and pick the guy up and he's, he's released and, and Frank gets out of prison and he is still really wanting to go to Brazil. He gets picked up. He um, She takes him to a bus station to go to New York and then he was going to go to Washington and was, was ready to again get a, a flight to Brazil. But unfortunately, this time he was picked up by uh, staff in, a, in the motel that he was staying in. Um, so he he has to make a run for it before he can uh, get the ticket to Brazil. And then he gets caught by police in an unmarked car oh. just two weeks later. Um, <laughs> after all this, you'd think that they'd probably extend his prison sentence. But no, um, in 1974, he'd only served five years of the sentence. Uh, they decided to release him um, on the condition that he help the uh, FBI to investigate. Uh, initially, it started out, out as, as check crimes, mm. um, so check forgery and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but later, it was it also included scam artists, confidence artists, basically anyone who was ripping <laughs> the government off or um, large private organizations. And much like the film, he just had to sign in once a week and he wasn't um, getting any pay for it. So I'm not sure how it really worked with living and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, he... He agreed to it, but he also didn't want to return to his family in New York. So basically said, I don't care where you put me, but you, you need to put me somewhere. Mm -hmm. So they put him in Texas of all places. Um, but it kind of worked out OK. Um, he he worked with them for, for years. He actually ended up meeting his wife um, while he was working for the FBI undercover. Hmm. He, uh, yeah, he... 
it, he was on a job with her. She didn't know he was FBI. And he ended up at the end of this uh, job, he he told her, I'm working for the FBI and I really like you and I want to continue this on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it was a obviously it was a total breach in, in protocol. But no, they, they got married. Um, it was seven <laughs> years after his original imprisonment. So it was just two years into his new job with the FBI. <laughs> so yeah um, I think so um, after all that he tried doing a whole bunch of regular jobs he did not become a baker but he was a grocer and he was a cook hey, um, yeah but he ended up not disclosing his criminal past to any of the employers so you can imagine how that went he got fired a shitload of times mm. because anytime they found out that was it over Um he started getting really frustrated and within a couple of years he ended up approaching a bank with the offer to essentially hold a training day mm -hmm. where he tell that he would tell them all the things that they were doing wrong and all the ways that they were vulnerable and um, said you don't have to pay me anything if you don't find it useful but if you do then um, I want you to pay me $500 which is like a massive you know fee back then but at the same time like for days mm. work but at the same time they they kind of thought well what is there to lose and and sure enough it worked and he's been working as a security expert ever since hmm. um he is now worth 10 million us dollars legitimately legally yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he and his wife are still together they have three kids um joseph shea the guy carl handready from the movie were indeed friends until he died Hmm. until Joseph Shea died. And yeah, he you can still check out his web, website, Abagnale and Associates. Uh, he's now based in <laughs> Oklahoma. Um, he advises on all sorts of fraud issues. He also does a shitload of interviews about his, uh, his dramatic um, youth. And yeah, he, he said on his website that he's helped more than 14,000 institutions. Um, he's even testified before the US Senate um, and yeah, talk, he's talked a lot about um, risks of giving out social security numbers for identification on uh, on your um, medical cards, and mm. yeah, it, it's actually it's kind of interesting. But he has said that you know his his um, his activities between 16 and 21 have defined him. And considering he's this year, he's 70 years old, well, he just turned 70. Mm -hmm. um, he does seem to harp on a, about them a lot in interviews and it's done him all right. Also, <laughs> um, his, his three sons, his youngest is now an FBI agent. Oh. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> and also legitimately finished law school. <laughs> um, but yeah, he he did have some really interesting things to say whenever he goes into companies as a consultant. One of his mm. strategies is he um, gets a bunch of memory sticks that are infected with shit mm -hmm. and he'll stamp confidential on the side of them and just leave them lying around places. And if you plug it into your computer, it'll <laughs> pop up and basically say you fucked up and what is wrong with you? And your computer is not infected with all the, and it's not entirely true, but it's, you can yeah, imagine yeah, yeah. how scary it yeah. is going, Oh shit. Um, so yeah, he does sound quite interesting. He does also really, um, yeah, I, I find it a little bit ridiculous that he, he makes all these comments about, Oh, I shouldn't be defined by my activities as a mm -hmm. as a young man, but also, you know, back then Hosting it was badass. No, but as well. but yeah, but he he's also like saying that you know back then it was really difficult to do, and now um, you can just pull images from Google and you mm. just stick everything together and get a laser printer, and it's really easy. It's like well. It's not quite that easy. He suggests that old check paper is standardized and it's, but, um, but at the same time, he does do some kind of interesting stuff and it all worked out all right. So it apparently did. I, I was actually going to bring that up when you said that he was like to this day doing these consultancy stuff, but from someone who made those comments about the modern forgeries and stuff, like. He can't be that on top of the modern threats, but I do like the USB stick thing, though. That's um, yeah, me a too. nice little touch. <laughs> but that's my story this week. 
it was a good one. And, well, for once, one that I actually knew. Well, I, I didn't know that many details. You've enlightened me, but um, I, I realized sooner than I thought that I knew who it was. I'm glad. <laughs> it was a very exciting moment. <laughs> I was also thinking a bit on your comment with... Uh, like after his was it, second breakout mm -hmm. um, that they didn't extend the sentence. But like that is more normal to me. But I did realize that that might be also more of a Nordic thing with like... Socialist Sweden, we don't extend your prison sentence. Of course you want to get out. Well, y work. yes, because I, I'm pretty sure I've read this somewhere, but I can't remember the proper facts, so I might be propagating bullshit, but I'm pretty sure that uh, part of the whole thing for people in prison, just like, no, no, the desire to be free is pretty much a basic human right, so of course you can't be punished for trying to get out of imprisonment. Seriously? I'm, I hope I'm not bullshitting, but I have I, very I like clear this. memory of this. I think that might be a thing, or was a thing. I'm going to have to fact check and then delete it if I look like an ass, but yeah. That's okay. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I do actually, of course, the movie will have more flair, but the details here that I don't remember from the movie, I, I do kind of prefer them. It's a good story. Yeah, I think it works. Mm. I, I do kind of prefer the real life story to the... Mm. Plus, he doesn't have to have the sad, depressing suit and eyes. <laughs> Like DiCaprio does Suit in the, and eyes. but you know whenever he has like the dead eyes when he's working in the check fraud department in the movie, yeah, true. and it's like, and why is your hair so greasy? You've been out of that that horrible French prison for years, and they leave out socialist Sweden. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> but yeah, I like yeah. it. It it's a good story. It's a good story. Shall we have a drink top up, and then I have to hear your story? Good plan. Okay, I say we do that. Okay, we'll be right back. Be back. Okay, we have a top up. We're ready. We definitely have a top up. I was not ready. I needed to swallow. Ooh. As is often the case. <clears throat> I'm excited. I I'm I'm Are looking forward to this. Yeah. <laughs> do do you know anything about my crime? I can't even remember what country it is. It is for the first time in ages for me, I think, um, the United States of America. What? Mm. You did the US as well? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, tell me your story. Mm. I will tell you a story that starts, or rather, well, let's say the interesting bits, takes place on the 30th of September in 2008. Okay. Mm. The suspense is building. <laughs> <laughs> so I mentioned it was um, uh, United States of America. You did? The More specifically in Monroe, Washington. Okay. So on this day. Yes. A short while after like 11 o'clock during the day, like before lunch and everything. Okay. A Brinks armored truck. So I'm not sure if you know Brinks. I didn't. It's I don't. Apparently, well, it's a company doing armored transport and stuff. Okay, so for, like, money, boxy things. Specifically those things, yes. Ah, why did I do it there? Maybe I heard mm. of this one. Oh, have you? I don't, I, no. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> it is a logical leap to take. Um, uh, but, yeah, this uh, this armored truck pulls up in front of a Bank of America branch. <gasps> You're not doing the one that inspired... No, that was... You're no, never mind. Out. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, you're doing the one that inspired Swordfish, the movie, but it's not because Swordfish was like 2003. Was it that long ago? I think so. Whoosh. Oh, okay. That was the first DVD I ever owned. I'm so sorry. What? Swordfish <laughs> was great. Have you seen the alternative endings? I don't think I have. It's um the alternative endings. No, I, I, I can't do the spoilers on here. Even for a fifteen-year-old movie, I'll have to. I'll have to look it up. Um, no, I'll, I'll tell you after we finish recording. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, but no, not swordfish. Sorry. Um, where were we? Yes, we were in front of Bank of America branch. <laughs> Armored car pulling up before lunch. We're talking eleven o'clock. So, a man is spotted walking towards the car. 
Mm -hmm. the truck rather. Mm -hmm. He's wearing jeans, a blue shirt, uh, some pretty standard work shoes, mm -hmm. yellow safety vest, and a painter's mask. Okay. Uh, so this is covering most of his face. Mm -hmm. He's also carrying like a gardener's, like a spray tank, you know, like you have a tank and a hose spray thing. Yeah. Basically, yeah. So he's walking towards the truck. And as the back of the armored truck opens, uh, the man kind of speeds up a bit, but still relatively discreetly moving towards the car, just faster. At this point, he drops the tank. Mm hmm. And just as the guard kind of comes out of the back, um, so the guard is like pushing a hand truck or mini trolley thing with a couple of uh, bags and he's uh, carrying some more stuff. As the guard is coming out, the man runs up towards him, really full on running. He pulls out something tiny, uh, sprays the guard with pepper spray. Oh, shit. The guard kind of freaks out, understandably. As would. Yeah, partly pepper spray, partly random Anyone dude running at of, you with crap. Yeah, and if you don't if notice them, face. and then, yeah, crap in your face. Guard kind of reels back. In that, like, split second, the man grabs two bags of the hand truck, containing, I think, over $400,000. Shit. And runs off. As you do. Mm hmm So, uh, there were a lot of witnesses around. And uh, there were also witnesses calling 911 as they saw this. Yeah. And the um, the guards as well, they gave chase and they reported it, uh, running out into, um, the, it was basically just out into the main parking area outside of the bank. Police responded to this as well. And they, like, police were on the scene, like, barely two minutes later. It was really snappy. But, like, as the guards chase after, uh, the, the only thing they could really find was over a dozen slightly confused men, all dressed in jeans, blue shirts, yellow safety vests, um, wearing painter's masks. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I absolutely love this stuff. So these slightly confused people were all, um, they had all responded to a Craigslist ad. Yay! That was asking for 15 to 20 men to show up near the Bank of America. Uh, it was on Old Own Road at 11.15. Nice. Uh, to work on a maintenance project called the Restore Monroe. Okay. Uh, so they were told to wear the same clothes as the man who disappeared. Same clothes, same tools. And they were offered uh, $28.5 per hour, which was well above the standard for that kind of work at that time. Yeah. So they were keen and interested and they were just like, milling about in the parking lot wake, waiting for some foreman or authoritative person to show up and tell them what to do. Yay. Uh, so he just kind of ran through that. And so this was the main point where for our movie connection, this is more kind of based on a movie than the other way around because like as this broke the news and it was a big mystery basically, uh, a lot of media compared it to the Thomas Crown Affair. I love the Thomas Crown Affair. You do? It's one of my... It's it's probably one of the movies I've watched the most. Because really? I just... I I love the music. The soundtrack is so great. I actually have the soundtrack the sound on my design phone. The sound is actually good. That's yeah. true. And um, I, I love the movie. I, I love Rene Russo. I love <laughs> um, Pierce Brosnan. Um, I love the girl who plays pouty, grumpy Anna the whole time. Um... Wait, do you, you remember who that is? I honestly don't. Um, Wait, was that the forger? Yes, you're ruining it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The 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 sort of almost like a daughter to him person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, she was so great. It works so well with the head kisses and all that stuff. Oh, it was so well, good. True. Um, but I love that movie. And have you seen the original? I think I might have, but that was years and years and years okay. ago. So, you know, at the very beginning, whenever he has the psychologist lady who's like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. talking to him, that is the main girl from the first one. <laughs> okay. That's actually exactly where I was going with the uh, that and... Um, okay, never mind. I'm just going to stop. 
<laughs> I love it. But but then you know what scene in the uh, movie I'm thinking yeah, of. Yeah, with the a... um the man in the apple and the bowler hats yeah, and the yeah, trench yeah, coats exactly. and all the briefcases full of shit. Which is also, you know, uh, one of my favorite uh, artists, actually. Oh, really? Mm. I, um, I was a big Magritte fan. You're a surrealist fan? And surrealist. kind of, yes. I had a very strong surrealist period, but uh, Magritte just kind of went through me. Huh. Well, went, through, went with me through all the periods, I suppose. Wow. I like him. Good for you. Hmm. I think Impressionism. Bit of Cubism here and there, but yeah. <laughs> Huh. Uh, always a knife for the surreal. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, considering how detail orientated I am, it's kind of ironic that I'm into um, impressionism. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair point. Yeah, surrealism works for you. It just works all around for you. <laughs> I yeah. shall take that as a huge compliment. No, like I mean, there, there's not many people I would say that about, but no, you're you're pretty good going. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yep, uh, I need a sip of my drink. Oh, okay. I love this. Tell me more. Tell me more. Yeah. So th this was basically since when this happened, this was a big mystery, and a lot of people compared it to that scene in particular because it was well planned. And um, I I'll tell you more about what happened because there were more details from the media as well. But they, I of course, focused on this bit. Yeah, I'm dying to know uh, whether the painter guys got paid before or after, or at all. As far as I've learned, not at all. Of course, oh, that's nothing. really quite shitty. It is kind of shitty. Yeah. They came the whole way out. What about travel expenses? Mm -hmm. What if they had to buy the painter's masks? True. Hmm. It's it's not good to exploit the poor proletariat, but um, it was still a good plan. This would never happen in socialist Sweden. <laughs> oh, it probably would. But, <laughs> um, uh, then I know. Maybe the sentence would be harsher. Ooh. Uh, but but yeah, so that was that was like the first point, having all his like little copycats out there to make it easier for him to escape. Um, after this, so hopefully that would take care of especially the guards or any pursuers, direct pursuers. Yeah. Um, but after this, the man, the robber, let's say. Yeah. Uh, he ran off into a slightly wooded area. There were witnesses who saw him there close to the river Woods Creek before he got into he got on an inner tube with the money and rushed down the river. What? Are you familiar with tubing? Yeah, like what you also do on ski slopes at, um when all the skiers have gone home. I was kind of thinking ski slopes, but I didn't see that as I looked it up just to make sure it's, it's like mostly... like a big rubber donut. Yeah, it's a rubber yeah, donut. That you um, pull behind a speedboat, typically. Or, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the ski slope sounds way more fun, but uh, yeah, Actually, basically the rubber donut. a horrible story about that. We were going to do that in New Hampshire on a school trip, mm -hmm. um, and there was a whole bunch of... Uh, I think there were three schools on the resort at the same time, mm -hmm. and the day before we were supposed to be doing it mm. another school did it girl came yeah. straight off in the ice went into a tree died yeah and I saw where that was going they didn't tell us initially why we weren't allowed to do it they just said they reassessed the um the safety and decided that we weren't mm. going to do it and everyone was totally up in arms because you can imagine it's like a bunch of 15 16 year olds and like they're just pissed off that we were promised we were going to get to do this mm -hmm. so in the end they had to tell us yeah. And then everyone shut up. Well, that's good, at least. Someone died. Some poor kid died. I, I've seen kids react more selfishly to similar news, so... Yeah, I, I don't know if I was selfless at the time. Mm. Probably just... No, probably just freaked out. Probably it just is. vividly picturing it and thinking of this moment where I get to share it. Mm. It's out of my brain. Anyway. <laughs> but yeah, basically donutting down a lazy river... Except maybe not so lazy. Maybe a rapidy river. Kind of. Uh, it wasn't that bad. So he had prepared this, though. So he had his donut thing. He <gasps> put the money That's in it. so cool. And um, then he basically went... Yes, he went up the river, I think. Um, so he, at, um, at the spot uh, later on the riverbank, the police found the pepper spray... A wig and Yay. the disguise. So he was wearing a wig as well. Uh, Very nice. A lot of people who called in kind of were distracted by he had like really scraggly hair and a ponytail. Oh. Uh, but that was just a wig. So that's that amazing. Mm. 
Put so, a pepper sprayed guard. Anyway. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it isn't mace, but it's not pleasant. Sure. Um, we should pepper spray each other. <laughs> should we? Now? Well, I've never been pepper sprayed. Have you? Oh, uh, I've been pepper sprayed. I have. Uh, I've not been maced, fortunately, but I've heard people have experienced both. And having experienced the baseline of pepper spray, I don't want to get maced. Are you sure? I could mace you, and you could pepper no, spray me. No, thank you. No, thank you. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> we can go out and tasting afterwards. That works as well. If you have a heart condition, that's probably pretty bad. Do I have a heart condition? I don't know. Maybe an undiagnosed one. I don't want to be responsible for that mess. Mm. What if it turns out you're allergic? Um, what enough. if there's like we can do it, We can do it on a roof, on the roof edge. So if I have a heart attack, I just fall down and then you say it was a suicide. I can give you a note beforehand. That's fine. Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> this is getting dark. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to get you in trouble. Thanks. Much appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I'm going. Wow. <laughs> Scraggy ponytail. Yes, that's great, Bonita. Oh, but I forgot the best part of the disguise. Yes. So n- not only the whole plan. Cod piece, and always having cod a, piece. Not a cod piece, but well, not the same direction. Okay, just cutting to it. He had like redesigned and made his own version of this outfit in the form of, you know, a Velcro tearaway like <gasps> like a stripper, stripper on stage oh, thing, which he amazing. made himself and apparently worked really well. Can um, you imagine? So he, like party boy from Jackass, but yeah, yeah. painter, yeah. painter so, boy. So so he uh, he basically <laughs> just came to the river, just ripped it all off, tossed it, got into his little donut, and um, that's amazing. Then he went. Uh, 200 yards so that's about 182 meters uh, downstream about 182 okay it was 182 dot something i'm not sure i'm sorry where i come from a meter is basically a yard that's what we do really yeah we're that's, we're kind of dicks <laughs> that's not good for space flight if everything we describe as being like however okay how far away is that town it's four miles up the hill and three miles down it's just like <laughs> Fair enough. Um, <laughs> but yeah 200 yards downstream and um, uh, after he went there he dumped the tube and got into a getaway vehicle yay um, so it, it looked like the entire robbery had just been like completely flawless uh-huh. uh, police had no no clues no ideas at all here mm. And a lot of people thought it would actually stay unsolved, uh, at least judging from the press. But one month later, a homeless man contacted the uh, police. Okay. Stating that he had seen something rather strange a couple of weeks before the robbery. So he had seen a man drive up to the bank's parking lot, pick up a disguise that was hidden behind some trash bins, <laughs> and like a swap little around bit with suspicious. that. Yeah. And the homeless man thought so to the point where he actually wrote down, wrote it down and uh, wrote down the license plate number of the car. Nice job, dude. Hmm. And he now presented it to the police once he saw the news. (laughs) So the car was registered to an Anthony Curcio. Curcio. Okay. Sounds legit. It's it's a name. It's a name. It's a good name. Solid name. So, yeah, this was suspicious, but I mean nothing solid but the police began looking into anthony and basically i mean surveilling him from all the details it sounds more like stalking but you know it's police it's their job uh but so what they managed to do was they had followed him without him noticing and Mm -hmm. at one point when he went to gas station he had um, on his way out he had a drink bottle and he tossed it so they fished that up Got some DNA, checked DNA from uh, from the wig and uh, another item he left behind. Okay. And it was a match. Yay. What? I'm just, I'm rooting for this whole thing. Oh, I'm enjoying this story. Great story. <laughs> Perfect for a Tuesday night. So after this, Anthony was arrested in uh, Lake Stevens. Okay. And they found $17,000 in cash with him. So he spent a fair chunk. Well, I mean, that's what he had on him, basically, uh, on him in in his car as they managed to arrest him. So he had a fair chunk on him. Mm. 
but the the actual like judicial process didn't go that great at first so a, a lot of evidence could have been circumstantial it kind of teetered a bit but the thing that pushed it over was that one of anthony's accomplices came forward and made a deal with the fbi okay so there were i think there were two accomplices possibly three that were a bit vague the thing is like there were no charges or on any of the other accomplices okay um since i think the main reason for that was also because they recovered basically all of the money in the end no way so there were some stuff just on regular expenses some things in common but no so the we we do know that he had an accomplice as a getaway driver and at least one more why? But, um, kind of sewing of the stripper outfit. I, I think that he suits himself. I think it might have been either something uh, sorting stuff afterwards, or I, I'm not entirely sure. Like I said, it's a bit vague due to, yeah. well, it, no charges and they weren't, nothing happened to these people. <laughs> they just, like, yeah, okay, that was a fun adventure. Then they snitched and they got away. Fair enough. Hmm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he, he was arrested in the end. But I will give you some backstory on Anthony, because we're not quite done. So Anthony had gone basically the classic stereotypical route of the popular American football player through college. Okay. So he had a good scholarship and, uh, and that whole classic setup. But one day during practice in school, he tore a ligament, mm -hmm. which basically ended his football career and led to him becoming addicted to Vicodin. Uh, which... It's not great. Not the best, no. So, uh, after his initial prescription for the actual injury ran out, he kind of was going back and forth between forging prescriptions and also trying to injure himself oh. so he'd get more legitimate prescriptions. So, that was when he turned to crime for the first time. Also, aside from the forgeries, he um, he also to fund this. Basically, he started like stealing furniture from from his university uh, and sold it on eBay. I don't even imagine university furniture is particularly expensive. I can imagine that you could probably sell it to students, which is kind of hilarious in itself. <laughs> but <laughs> yep, but no, he he managed to sell a bunch on eBay. Got a bit of money through that. Uh, he also started selling counterfeit baseball cards, as in supposedly rare ones, what? and made a bunch of money. <laughs> but as he managed to fund this, he kind of went on, and he kind of stepped up from Vicodin to cocaine and then to heroin. Woo! Yeah. But like th that was his route, and his life was kind of stuck in that addictive trying to fund that yeah. state uh i still think it's kind of impressive how we planned the heist though because like he was he took his time planning everything out he was uh, monitoring all of the deliveries to the bank yeah but don't you think that's that's really like the way it's been planned is the way a heroin addict would plan it like you would think about um all the how to get in, how to get out, how to make sure there's a bunch of other people there to take the heat off you. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, of the elegance of the crime itself, mm -hmm. pepper spray him, grab the bags and run. What? It's tacky. It worked splendidly without putting anyone in any severe danger. I, I think that works. I don't know. Maybe it's more of something that you would plan if you were monged out, like the, the paranoia of weed that would just make you meticulously plan your oh. uh, stripper painter outfit oh. and um, getting a donut and go down river, up I'll, river. I'll, I'll get you some more information here and we'll see if you agree, but I, I still okay. think it's kind of pretty. The um, pepper spraying, grabbing the bags and running is, is pretty inelegant, yeah. yeah? The rest of it is, is very I mean, it's nice. elegant because it was efficient and it worked. Yeah. Fine, keep going. <laughs> also, you told me you had pictures. I'm, I'm looking forward to these. I do have a picture, but that's later. Okay. I have a picture today as well. Okay. You'll get your pictures. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so first off, all the planning. Like he was monitoring all the deliveries to the, to the bank, mm -hmm. uh, taking notes on everything, trying to estimate how much money was uh, usually transferred and what was the higher seasons. He kind of timed it with... Um, 
like when ATMs needed to be restocked and the demand on that as well. Okay. Uh, so there would be as much as possible. Uh, he also like scoped out the actual bank, checking all the security cameras, looking for blind spots, both from the cameras and the armored vehicles. Mm -hmm. And he had a good setup for it. Uh, on the escape plan as well, he did several practice runs. Like, yes, on the one hand, that combined with the homeless guy kind of did him in in the end. Uh, but um, like partially checking with like uh, checking with his uh, like stashing the stuff and seeing how he could set up the entire disguise thing, but also the escape down the river because apparently at first he was planning on using a jet ski to get Aww. away on the river. I don't have that many details apart from some quotes on it didn't go that well. Oh. <laughs> and I think he failed miserably with the jet ski. Oh, honey. Uh, so instead he went for the inner tube. He had set up a uh, like discreet cable cable line along the river. Okay. So he could go and also like control and uh, like power himself if need be okay. uh, with the line and get through. So Probably a good plan. Yeah, he, he made sure he had a backup there. Um and, and yeah, also other tests with the disguises and the terrorway stuff and all that. <laughs> uh, but uh, in the end, Anthony was sentenced to 72 months in a federal prison. Okay. And he had a pretty rough time in prison. Oh. But that was rough in the... Uh, I, I'm not going to say that it was too formative or so, but he, in the end, he actually did manage to turn his life around. No more heroin? He got clean. He got through a drug treatment program. Hey. And he started becoming productive. He wrote, while in jail, he wrote and illustrated several children's books, including one titled My Daddy's in Jail. Oh. Which I will show you a picture of. The really? Ah. <laughs> he drew these. Yep. So he wrote and illustrated them. Wow. Is the bird supposed to be the kid? Or is the, no, the ants are supposed to be the kid? Why is everyone of a different species? <laughs> because it's a kid's book. Come on. <laughs> Bears don't of. make mouse babies. And ant babies. There's adoption. I don't know. This whole thing is a bit weird. <laughs> and he was definitely off drugs when he did this. <laughs> yes. What about the snake with the parachute? <laughs> I don't think I've seen that. Now, you're spending way too much time analyzing this children's books cover. I'm, I'm sorry. There you go. Look at now the snake. Now I need to find the snake. Oh, look at that snake. I mean, what if the snake goes upside down? He's coming right off that parachute. <laughs> I feel worse for the shark blimp thing. Um, now you got me started. Never mind. Huh. He, he was productive and trying to do good things at least. Um, I mean, better that than mm. doing, yeah. Oh, yeah, true. And like, also impressive coming completely clean with the drugs and everything. Yeah, no, that's and, that's really cool, especially considering uh, I imagine that's pretty hard to do in prison. Uh, yeah, I can think so. Uh, but yeah, so finally he, he was getting through this. He was released in April 2013. Uh, okay. And ever since, and like to this day, he... Um, he still appears to have devoted his life to prevent other youths from uh, going the same way he did. Wow. Uh, he's doing a lot of like public speaking focused on drug abuse and crime prevention yeah. and working against that. And I know I, I, I did kind of get stuck on this one, even though like, yeah, the, the movie tie in was minor. It, it's valid, but minor. <laughs> um, but just seeing this partially well planned crime, even though he messed up a bit, well-planned little heist and also surprisingly upper ending, which is not that common for my <laughs> stories no, at least. That's super nice. No um, one's dead. No one's... Yeah. I mean, pepper spray guy, I assume, is fine now. Yeah. Yeah. He's good. Okay. I, I'm making the executive decision. I'm sorry <laughs> if you're listening to this and you're traumatized. But um, no. Uh, I think overall this was... No, I, I thought it was interesting going in the other direction. Let's see. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> so that was my story.
And now we need to have a drink. We do. Do we know what we're doing? Um, I had a suggestion or, well, that was a thought that kind of got stuck in my head. Okay. Me. Well, I just had a thought there, not. Ooh. But maybe. Does it involve I'm, snakes? No. I, I was thinking when you were saying uh, about good things, but not usually being good things. Ah, mm. rose tinted glasses. And I, I made a <laughs> um, Turkish delight style cocktail over the weekend. Ooh. Um, but what were you thinking? Because we can do that another time. We can do a whole Turkish episode. I, I'm a sucker for Turkish delight, but um, that might be interesting with the Turkish episode. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it, no, I was thinking since we were talking movies, I kind of got the um, Golden Palm Award stuck in my head and doing oh, like a cocktail yeah. for that, doing something yellow, probably mango, possibly with some coconut skewer. I do mango. So. Uh, okay something else yellowish honey uh, eh, possible uh, like i said this was just the main thought that struck me and i haven't been able to think of something else but if you have any um if you had thoughts since before we can discuss no it. we can uh, we can take a little bit of pause and have a rummage around the uh, wonderful cabinet of wondrous I mean, wonders you can go over now and see if there's mm. anything that that tickles your fancy Off you go. There's a couple of new ones. Fair enough. I shall rummage. Go rummage. Mm. We are back. We're back. With cocktails. Or is it dessert? It's kind of dessert cocktail. (laughs) With banana splits. Mm Mm-hmm. And I must say, I did not expect it to be this radiant, as in radiantly yellow, but I do think the chocolate kind of uh, amplifies it. Yeah. Mm. Cheers. Yes. Cheers. Mm. Oh, that's thick. <laughs> <laughs> Is it too thick? Unexpectedly thick. I can't think of a better word than savory. Like, this is sweet. This is definitely sweet, but it's something about the full, like the, if there was a sweet <laughs> equivalent for umami, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Mm. Vodka. <laughs> really? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Isn't it? What seaweed is to food, vodka is to, to dessert. Rice. What? <laughs> 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 no. Okay, never mind. Um, we never got any better suggestions on the describe the flavor of uh, shrimp, right? I don't remember. Uh, I've been really bad on Twitter. What with all my, my real life stresses. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we're drinking banana splits, which are consisting of vodka, avocat, which is like a Dutch egg custardy liqueur thing. It's not Dutch, is it? Yeah. Really? Really? I don't think so. I think so. In oh. fact, I'm quite certain of it. Oh, fair enough. It's just a really common thing all across Europe, for me at least. Oh, really? Mm. The only time you have it in uh, the UK and Ireland is around Christmas time. You have it as a snowball cocktail. Do you know what that is? I do not. Uh, okay, so a snowball cocktail is... I think it's just half lemonade, half advocate, and a squeeze of lime. Okay. It's... I mean, it sounds gross, and to be honest, it kind of is. It sounds like it would kind of curdle a bit. It doesn't curdle, but it does. It's it's weird. It's yeah. it's kind of weird. <laughs> um, it's just weird. Anyway, um, so we're drinking cocktail with avocat, vodka, frangelico, banana liqueur, chocolate, a little bit of um, cow cow white. Mm-hmm. And a swirl of chocolate sauce in the glass. A very appreciated and generous swirl, I'd say. Yeah, and they're in the <laughs> King's Day glasses. Oh, right, right. Some of the King's Day glasses. <laughs> Next year, I need to bring packing material with me. In your backpack? Yeah. Hmm. But isn't this good? This is like, mm-hmm. taste the nuts, taste the bananas, taste the chocolate. There's a lot of bananas to taste. Uh, I'm mostly getting bananas and chocolate. The nuts are a bit subdued, but they do amplify the experience. <laughs> oh, okay. Now we're back full time again. Mm-hmm. For the time being, if you missed us, let us know. We might disappear <laughs> again if we're not loved. <laughs> we need your love. This is true. We are vain, vain creatures. It's true. Very vain. You should see Onitsen right now. His hair's all up. 
<laughs> perfectly, perfectly styled a little baby ponytail. If you say so. I don't know. <laughs> the magic of radio. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah. <sighs> okay. No, what that? <laughs> um, <laughs> and on that note. And on uh, that note. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm ready to do goodbyes, to be honest. And I will say thank you for listening. If you have any feedback, requests, questions, whatever, hit us up on Twitter. We're at Crime by the Bar. And if you have something longer to talk about, rant about, or uh, share with us, then send us an email, crimebythebar at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. And also, if you actually do enjoy our episodes and want more and want to help us make more. uh, No, if you find value in what we do, Mm. you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash crime by the bar. And that's it for this week. Well, no, that's it for Tuesday. We continue movie week on Friday. Mm -hmm, With more crime. Yeah. um, And you seem to think yours is going to be worse this Friday, but I Mm -hmm. think you might be wrong. Really? Mine's horrible. I love this. We're getting into competing on both fronts. (laughs) So if you thought this was a nice light one and it's too light for you, then uh, we have a horrible one coming on Friday. And if you find this one the right level, then maybe Friday is one to just uh, play during the day when you're not likely Mm. to uh, get the spooks. When you have a lot of colleagues to hold your hand and whatnot. Yeah. Well, you need to be careful. Sometimes I listen to, to things and... And all of a sudden, I'm very jumpy in work. (laughs) (laughs) Mm, But thanks for listening, everyone. And we hope you have a great week. And we'll see you on Friday. Bye. Bye. We need to open the window to the studio. Mm -hmm. Let the wind blow in your hair. And also... Let our episode fly out to the masses. Okay, this is getting too much. Tiny little wings. Yeah? No? No. No. (laughs) Okay, okay. I haven't had enough to drink to to tolerate this level of sentimentality. Fair enough, fair enough. (laughs)